Good evening. One week into the Gulf War, we take a look at the mind of the man whose invasion of Kuwait last summer has led to the present conflict. A former bodyguard to Saddam Hussein tells us that he was ordered to kill by the Iraqi leader and that he saw Saddam himself commit murder. Even more worrying is the bodyguard's view of Iraq's progress towards making nuclear weapons. Because I work with this, this group and I know it's ready, the bomb is ready. That interview later in the program. But first, the civilian front line in the war against Iraq, Israel, on the receiving end of attack from Saddam Hussein's Scud missiles. Julian Mannion has spent the past few days and nights in two households, an Israeli family in Tel Aviv and a Palestinian family on the West Bank. Here's his report. The Gulf War has transformed Tel Aviv from Israeli heartland into front line. And as the attacks continue, in spite of the arrival of American Patriot missiles, the residents of this city are now living a nightmare that they had prayed would never happen. The Ross family have seen their comfortable middle-class existence turned upside down. Every evening, they and the friends who are staying with them wait anxiously for the next strike. Thelma Ross now wears a radio headset continuously throughout the night. I'm wearing the radio so that I can hear the alarm because the house is so noisy all the time and the alarm is so weak that the first day I almost didn't hear it. And once we heard it, I thought I was standing arguing with my husband whether it's an alarm or not. So now I know on the radio, it's a very sure alarm. It's ta -ta 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 -ta. So I wear it like this and then I know. They have done this for real eight times in the last week. Inside the cramped shelter, the family dons gas masks and waits for news on the radio. Though all the missiles so far have carried conventional explosives, the government is convinced that Saddam Hussein has chemical warheads and may, when cornered, use them. The threat of gas has provoked national trauma, which the Ross family is trying to live through. Gas is, is attached to Holocaust. Gas is attached to uh, being uh, suffocated and not to be able to do anything about it. It's, it's a humiliating also feeling. If you fight back, if you have a weapon to fight, how can you fight it back with this? You cannot, it's, it's all so ugly. Two days ago, my son told me, Ima, you know what? I feel, I feel like having the alarm already. And it's kind of crazy, but you know what I felt? That I feel the same. I want the alarm to come. So I got it over with. But Israel's nightmare is also being lived by an Arab population. In the hills above Tel Aviv, the occupied West Bank is now under 24-hour curfew. Dodging the Israeli patrols, we came here to visit a Palestinian family. Living under the flight path of Iraq's missiles, the Khatib family also fear the threat of gas. But as they practice an alert, they have only towels soaked in bicarbonate of soda to protect them. The Israelis have promised to distribute gas masks, but only a minority of West Bankers have so far received them. I'm very worried about my children. Uh, I look to their eyes and, and I don't know what to, uh, how to help them if, if we got any problems if we got a missile or anything. What effect has it had on the children, your daughter, for example? Uh, she's, uh, she's very wor uh, worried about the mask. She keeps asking why we don't have uh, such a mask. Why uh, these children on the TV have uh, these masks and we don't have. Bring us, buy, uh, buy for us, she, she asks. Like the Rosses, the Khatibs follow the war news night and day, sometimes getting a different version of events from Jordanian television. Here too, the family's nerves are frayed by long periods spent indoors. But the Khatibs have no choice. They're under curfew. Every day from the early morning, the Israeli military patrols uh, announce uh, the curfew and they say literally that any person who uh, might be seen on the streets is going to be shot dead. It means that uh, I am not allowed to leave my home uh, 24 hours so far for five days. This is the end of the fifth uh, day. 
So uh, on the one hand, uh, there is a, a beginning of uh, food shortage uh, in our case. Uh, and <clears throat> there is a growing uh, nervous, uh, everybody is bored, everybody is nervous, because uh, there, it's not only the war, but on the top of the war, we have also the curfew. With his wife and children safely inside the sealed room, Ghassan taped up the door to make it airtight. Then, like thousands of families all over Israel and the West Bank, the Khatibs listened anxiously to reports coming over the radio. First confirmation of a missile attack. Then, after about an hour, most of the country was given the all clear. They, they used two Patriots, but uh, didn't work. And two missiles landed over Tel Aviv. So they are asking Tel Aviv people to remain in their rooms while the rest of the country can be released from their uh, rooms. So it's over. <laughs> when the news that Tel Aviv had been hit came through, we heard some of Kazan's Palestinian neighbors shouting in celebration, Allah Akbar, God is great. First, uh, I have to say that I, I, I don't feel happy at all when uh, missiles hit Tel Aviv or when Israelis are uh, hurt. I have uh, many Israeli friends, uh, peaceful uh, Israeli people, uh, activists, etc. And I, I don't believe that there should be uh, indiscriminate uh, attacks. Uh, but on the other hand, some of the Palestinians on the popular level do feel happy when a rocket hit Tel Aviv. And uh, uh, I don't agree on that, but I can fully understand it because uh, Tel, Aviv, Tel Aviv for for the Palestinians means this the, 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 the source of all kind of evils that you can imagine. It is the source of all the torturing, all the killing, or the all the the, the, the uh, harassments that we are living. So if you have an enemy who has been occupying you and killing your people for 23 years, aren't you going to be happy when he is hit? In Tel Aviv, daylight revealed the full damage caused by just one missile carrying 500 pounds of high explosive. Thelma and her mother came to witness it and immediately had to fight back the tears. Thelma was once a well-known peace activist, and for both of them, the experience marked another stage in an emotional and political transformation that is now affecting many Israelis. It's so terrible that you feel sick. I feel sick. And I think you feel sick because uh, you feel death. What do you feel about uh, that Israel should now do in response to this? Are, are you one of the people who feels that Israel should retaliate? I tell you, I, I have two sides. One side is my emotions, and I'm fed up of hearing of this beautiful and sweet new words that is called restraint. And it's very nice, and uh, everybody likes you. And it's nonsense. But uh, I want the things to be done as they should be done. I trust my army. That's the only thing I trust. Just before we came on air, I spoke by satellite to King Hussein's brother, Crown Prince Hassan. Your Royal Highness, there are reports that many Jordanians have actually welcomed the Iraqi missile attacks on Israel. How do you yourself regard them? I am appalled by the extending uh, civilian casualties. I watched the program earlier and saw the uh, casualties in uh, Tel Aviv, and indeed I watched the Palestinian families, uh, some of whom were reported as being jubilant about this. Uh, effectively, nobody can be uh, jubilant about the loss of life. Yet at the same time, I wish you had been able to uh, see the uh, report by CNN that has just come out of uh, similar scenes in uh, uh, Baghdad. We've been told uh, again in the town of Fallujah, civilian casualties are mounting. So I'm afraid that uh, no one is being uh, spared in this. And I hope we get to a point where we can think of human beings uh, and uh, see through some of the uh, political side of it. 
You wrote yourself recently in a newspaper article, we will not allow ourselves to act as a corridor for anyone, speaking, of course, of Jordan. Now, have you changed your mind as far as Scud missiles are concerned, or is it simply that there's nothing you can do about it? We've uh, not uh, been able to do anything about uh, Scud missiles, or indeed uh, of uh, missiles of any sort. We don't have the equipment uh, to intercept. Even the Israelis uh, had to uh, turn uh, to the uh, Patriot, uh, which is now American manned on Israeli soil. Uh, we were deprived these missiles for some uh, uh, a period of uh, time that is to say nothing as sophisticated as Scud, but even handheld American made uh, missiles largely because of the efficiency of the Israeli lobby in the United States. But uh, clearly, as uh, John Major said of Israel, it is indefensible that uh, a non combatant should be drawn into hostilities, uh, and I think that applies more so to Jordan, which does not have sophisticated weaponry or means uh, to deliver, or even uh, largely to protect civilian population, as you saw in the case of the Palestinians in the occupied territories. What will be Jordan's reaction if and when Israel retaliates? Well, you see, the point is that uh, if the uh, Israeli reaction is intended to draw Jordan in, then uh, clearly our reaction would be to defend ourselves. We have no reason to believe that that is their sole option. Uh, and uh, uh, clearly at the present time with round-the-clock uh, allied bombardment of Iraq and tens of thousands of uh, bombs, there is no read other than possibly the moral factor and the political symbolism of it. There is criticism in the West of, of the King's stance in this conflict, although it's a stance that has won him a lot of popularity in Jordan. Uh, we've heard even of some congressmen saying aid should be cut off to Jordan. Is his majesty playing the right diplomatic game on the world stage? I think that uh, the uh, game, as you call it, of having sought a peaceful uh, uh, solution to this in the first 48 hours with the knowledge of Western countries and indeed of Arab countries in, uh, uh, involved would have been right in that it would have been successful if there had been as much energy given uh, to a diplomatic solution as there was uh, to the military option. We received the Secretary General of the United Nations here and uh, we have tried to facilitate every diplomatic initiative and that is uh, certainly in keeping with everything that we've done over 23 years of the Arab-Israeli conflict to seek a negotiated settlement. Uh, of course today you see this massive bombardment and uh, a result of what? The initial objective was the defense of Saudi Arabia the restoration of Kuwait, are the Iraqi people expected to uh, pay for what is really a major military campaign on both sides? Does Jordan believe, by seeking to maintain this, uh, this delicate and dangerous balance of policy, that precisely because of that, perhaps, Jordan may be able to initiate some kind of peace process? I think uh, at uh, a given moment, if that ever uh, came, it would be opportune, and I think this has been our feeling over the last five months, to have a, a country with uh, uh, an independent and objective role. It was put to me, although it is uh, a hypothetical, that uh, Jordan can uh, assist in the, in the humanitarian uh, uh, role, and uh, uh, I was wondering, uh, even on the question of uh, POWs, whether there was a role uh, there for Jordan. I'm not suggesting uh, anything here because no one has asked us. But uh, clearly, to have a middle ground position by Jordan could contribute, if this were ever uh, possible, how to healing wounds. How best do you think you could take such an initiative? How might it be possible? At the moment, there are no political initiatives uh, uh, receiving any international attention. The organization, the Islamic Conference, the Algerians and the non-aligned have all asked for uh, uh, a cease uh, fire, uh, that is to say, appeal to all sides to stop hostilities. But today, as the uh, President of the United States has said, there is no pause, and clearly the other side also is equally determined to fight it out to the end. Do you think that Jordan can keep out of the war? I think uh, uh, clearly that Jordan will do its uh, utmost uh, to uh, continue to suffer the results of this crisis since the 2nd of August. Uh, we are already affected by the occupation annexation of Kuwait, which we opposed in terms of the increasing number of refugees. We are ex affected by the embargo. Uh, and we hope, effectively, that the international community will help us maintain 
our credibility in the middle ground. Your Royal the, Highness, uh, thank you very much indeed for talking to us. Thank you very much. Saddam Hussein's military challenge to the West prompts a very basic question. Is he mad or does he have a well-worked-out plan? Richard Lindley, who interviewed him during Iraq's last war with Iran, now reports on a dictator who's no stranger to killing. What's in the mind of Saddam Hussein? It's Saddam Hussein's way to implicate others in his murderous violence, to make them dip their hands in blood too. It's rare for people like this to break ranks and live to tell the tale. But in Paris, we met just such a man, a former captain in Saddam Hussein's bodyguard. He calls himself Karim and says he worked for Saddam Hussein for five years until he sickened of the dictator's violence. He killed many, many people. He killed his, his cousin, Saadun al Nasri. And he don't killed him in pistol. He killed him in, in, in the knife, like this. And what does he look like when he's doing this, when he was killing somebody? What is his reaction? He's become very heavy. When he killed Riyadh Hussain, he put his pistol again in this, and he is loved. And I think there's a link there between the way torturers work and the way that he's using his Scud missiles against Israel. One of the uh, crucial elements in the torturer's armory is not so much the fact that he comes and tortures you, but the fact that after he's tortured you for a few days in a row, he will then stop suddenly, unexpectedly, and go away. His megalomania motivates him. His vaunting ambition, because he doesn't want to be merely the leader of the Arab world, but the leader of the Muslim world as well. And even people who were once his enemies, such as the, the dissident Iraqi opposition, now with their headquarters in Iran, now support him, if only because he's standing up to the, to the dynamic, the, the tremendous West with all its power. Sam Hussein probably believes in his own destiny and believes in supernatural forces will come to his aid. So no matter how badly things are going, he will probably still believe that something good will happen at the end to save him. And that has certain unfortunate consequences. What it might mean is that he will really stop at nothing. I work with six scientists. scientists and scientists. Scientists. I think they are from Belgium or they are from French. I don't know exactly. And I stay with him two months in his security. But everybody knows he is trying to make an atomic bomb. How do you know he has it? Because I work with this, this group and I know it's ready, the bomb is ready. That report from Richard Lindley. Time will tell what something great and glorious will cost Saddam's own people and the countries ranged against him.